Hello, I'm Kat Sarfis, bookseller at Barnes & Noble. Today we are joined by the brilliant V.E. Schwab. Victoria is a best-selling author of over 20 books, including the Shades of Magic series, the Villain series, the Monsters of Verity series, and the Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, just to name a few. The Fragile Threads of Power, Victoria's long-awaited return to the Shades of Magic series, weaves a gripping tale of old heroes and new enemies, a welcome return to the dazzling world of thieves, travelers, magical battles, and epic adventures. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. So I have to go back uh, to the beginning. It's sure. been a minute, you know, since we all were first introduced to Kel and Lila and Holland. Take us back and tell us the origin story uh, for the Shades of Magic series. And then when the fragile threads of power started to take shape. Yeah. So let's see. I um I was 25 when I wrote A Darker Shade of Magic. Oh, I don't know how to measure age <laughs> in terms of the books that I wrote at those ages. So I just turned 36. I was 35 when I wrote Threads of Power, 25 when I wrote A Darker Shade of Magic. Yeah. I wanted to write a portal fantasy novel. I've always wanted to. Breaking down into that like Tolkien versus Lewis camp where Tolkien's world is one you will only ever access through the world of a book. And Lewis is the one that tells you there's magic in your world. You just have to find the doorway. So I've always been somebody who likes to build a doorway out of reality. I wanted to write a love letter to Avatar The Last Airbender and yeah. Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood and kind of my favorite um, totemic magical systems. And I also, though, wanted to do something a little different. So there are four worlds in the series, but rather than design four completely distinct worlds, what I really was fascinated by was the idea of designing one world four ways. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, can I design the same scaffolding, one geographical landscape, and then from there build four different houses? And essentially these four worlds, uh, which Kel calls gray, red, white, and black, uh, because that's how he thinks of them, they are differentiated by their relationship to magic. So they were all connected and there was a cataclysmic event in Black London, which became so powerful that it essentially consumed itself. And the other three worlds sealed themselves off from it. And they each have a very different relationship to magic. Now, White London, which was right next to Black London, now like enslaves magic and tries to force it and control it. And in response, it withdraws and resists. Red London, which is the one that Kel lives in, uh, one of our main characters, is a world that has worshipped magic like a god, and their world has thrived because of it. And then Grey London is our world, uh, circa 1819, and its magic's been forgotten. So it was really about like the philosophical idea of how the relationship between mortality and power manifests in these different landscapes. And so, yeah, that's where it all started. Why? <laughs> and all, and I and I and I'm part of me feels like, of course, London. But why London? Several reasons. One, <laughs> uh, it, it was kind of a nod to the fact that so many fantasy is classically set mm -hmm. there. And like, having visited in my youth, my mom is English. And I remember going to London for the very first time and just being so astonished by the layering of history in that city. Mm -hmm. You know, Ameri as an American by birth, like it's very young. So many aspects of American culture and American history, not Native American history, obviously, but like Westernized history. It's very young. And you don't really have this sense of going back hundreds and hundreds of thousands and thousands of years. And I was amazed by this idea that you could round a corner in London and feel like you stepped a century one direction yes. or another. So I was fascinated by that. I also, because I was building one geographical template and then designing new city on top of it, I really wanted to pick a city that was kind of iconic and also simple. So if you reduce London to its most simple geography, you have a North Bank, a South Bank, and a river in the middle. Yeah. So I could take it down to stud in that way and then build four Londons with the geographic similarity of the North Bank, the South Bank, and the river. And that would at least help readers kind of hold it in their mind. Yeah. No, I mean, like, again, it's I think what you were saying, like, because of, I don't know if it's just because of the age or because of just, if there is something about London you feel like you're going to turn a corner and step into or like have there is going to be a portal or like there's going to do you going to step into a magical door so now the fragile threads of power which is like a new a new arc and i feel like i'm getting this uh, uh, like asked this question like is it a prequel is it after? <laughs> is it in the world yes. like i need more information <laughs> and i'm like okay it's in the world but it's gonna have its own arc 
Um, so when set, did that, did yeah. you always know, were you always like, oh yeah, I'm going to have this and then I'm going to start a new arc or like, when did this, when did gradual, when did threads, well, I don't want to say, I don't, I hate calling it threads now because of. I know, I know, <laughs> I know. I'm like, wow, SEO nightmare. <laughs> Thanks, sucker. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> so threads of power is set seven years after mm-hmm. the end of Shades of Magic. So Shades of Magic is the first arc in the series. And then Threads of Power is the second arc in the series. I write my stories in reverse, meaning like I know how all of them end before I know how they begin. And so for Shades of Magic, I knew the end of A Darker Shade of Magic and the end of Conjuring of Light before I started writing the series. I was about halfway through Conjuring of Light when there was a plot point that I needed, which is this favor that Maris, who's the captain of this floating market, which is an illegal market, she basically gives Lila a gift in exchange for a future favor. And I knew at the moment I wrote that, that I wasn't going to have time to call the favor in. Or if I did call the favor in, it it would have been rushed. It would have been rushed to tie up a loose thread. And I just was like, okay, I'm going to hold it. And I'm going (laughs) to see. uh, It was kind of the first moment where I thought, "Uh uh-oh, like I would like to give myself an opportunity to return. I'm going to plant this little piece, this favor. And then that it all grew out of there. And by the time I finished revising Conjuring of Light, I knew I wanted to do a new trilogy. But because I never want to tell the same story twice, I felt very strongly that this cannot simply be continuation. It is not a a straightforward, one directional continuation of the existing cast. There is an old cast and a new cast. So in the Fragile Threads of Power, the old cast is probably the largest that they will be in terms of the story, because it's kind of how we're guiding readers in. And and Mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that I didn't say like, oh, definitely Kel and Lila will be in it. And then they have like a one page cameo. They are hefty plot pieces. But I also really wanted to set myself a new storyline and a new objective or else what's the point of writing something new when people could just reread what they love. And so that's my own creative philosophy. I know there are plenty of people out there who just really like living in a place a fictional setting, but for me, there has to be a a strong enough premise. No, but I think, and I think you do that really well. And I think that there's, you know, knowing when there's an ending and that, you know, not everything, you know, maybe gets wrapped up or like you said, or if it, if it doesn't, then it, maybe it has its own, it has its own place. It has its own story. It's its own contained unit. Think about this because like my goal as an author, particularly is to make sure that you as the reader feel like the characters you love keep living when you put the book down, that you're simply no longer invited to follow them. I don't ever want to write characters that you feel cease to exist without your attention. And so this was an interesting exercise for me because I was like, okay, Kel, Lila, Ryan, Alucard have now lived seven years. I have to make you believe that they are not the same people that you left at the end of Conjuring of Light. They have to feel seven years yeah. older and more experienced. And that was exciting and extremely daunting as a writer. Yes. I mean, because you do have to, I mean, not, not, we're not going to do spoilers, but you know, you no, do no, have no. to kind of go back in time a little bit to sort of like yeah. when you're in, in fragile to sort of set like, okay, so this is, this is when this happened. And this is kind of, you know, like I said, you're kind of setting this foundation for this new art, for this new story, for these new characters. And again, seven years. I mean, that's a lot. I mean, think about your own life. Like <laughs> that was the irony of this is like, basically it ended up timing out as almost exactly seven years for me between finishing mm-hmm. conjuring of light and finishing fragile threads of power. And I was like, Oh, it gave me a little bit of permission because one thing I always am a little worried about is that, you know, books, they become time capsules of the people that we are when we're writing them, but then we finish them and they become static and preserved and we as creators continue to grow. And so one of the hardest things to come back to a series is I'm glad I gave myself the seven years because I think it would have been much harder to return to the series right after Conjuring of Light and then to for me to be seven, eight years older as a writer and trying to almost mimic the writer that I was in my late twenties. Yeah. We always put so much into ourselves, into anything we do. And it's hard to sort of break apart. And I mean, I would say in these last maybe seven years, particularly there's been, I think there is a thread that I think we're all connected Uh to in terms of events and things that have happened. I feel like even thinking seven years ago, it's like, I don't even know who I was. I, I know, Or maybe I, I thought I did at the time. And then like you said, you, you grow and you yeah. not necessarily change or maybe for you do change, but it you is it's just evolution. You evolve. Yeah. Exactly. So I was actually yeah. had this question um, I was going to ask you later, but now since we're talking about it, you know, you have these characters and I think we do get, I think as readers, we do have formed these attachments. We can't help it. You know, that we, we just have these attachments to these characters. And so 
Fragile Third to Power, Fragile Third to Power, we have sort of like a new cast of players, but we also get to reconnect. And so can you talk a little bit about that sort of revisiting old friends, saying goodbye to others? Because in other, your other book, you know, Standalone, Addie LaRue, you you say goodbye. That's it. Yeah. You know, like that's, that's the story. Much to people's chagrin. Oh uh, yeah, I know. I know. Do an event and they're like a sequel. And I'm like, no, no, never, <laughs> never. You left um, so, <laughs> Yeah. So what it like, so, you know, being able to say goodbye to some revisiting others, how does that play on you? It's like coming home. It yeah. was truly like, it was such a gift. One of the more daunting things about starting a series and one of the reasons I like to write standalones as well is because there's so much that goes into building a world from scratch and it's daunting and you do so much and then you have to leave it when you're done and you're like, but I just did so much work. <laughs> like it was really a joy. You know, I could, I could write 20 books in this world and not touch every corner of it. One of the reasons I choose London is like for the sheer necessity of having a geographic pin so that we don't become a travelogue, so that it doesn't become something that's massively expansive. But it also means like we call them, you know, red London, white London, black London, gray London, but there's whole red, black, white and gray worlds outside of London. There's empires. There's And so it's very easy to kind of like feel overwhelmed as a creator by Mm -hmm. the prospect of editing, of like um, self-editing, of choosing what to include and what not to include. And so a series is a really beautiful thing. And, and this is my first time returning to a world that I built and finished an arc for, which is its own daunting prospects as an author. Because you think, oh, oh, I hope they don't say the last one was better. Or I hope I have to somehow make this one. But like, there's <laughs> you your own pressure. On the whole, it's a joy. And one of my goals, is like one of my challenges, but I really love it, is the idea of how can I introduce new forms of magic? to a world that you already understand without it feeling like I'm breaking it. Mm -hmm. So like I've tried in each book of the series uh, uh, in every one of the Shades of Magic books and now in Threads to like to begin each book and give you a form of magic you haven't experienced yet. So like, for instance, between A Darker Shade of Magic, which was our first book and A Gathering of Shadows, you meet Alucard Emery. And Alucard mm-hmm. has the ability to see the threads of magic. You also learn that he is a triad magician. He can control three elements. Like there's all these pieces. And so my goal then is, okay, I've built this world. I've designed how magic functions. How can magic then go through its own form of industrial revolution? How can magic begin to grow and change in fragile threads of power? There's an inventor queen whose like entire interest is in taking magic and, and making it improve. So I think one of my like little pet peeves when I'm reading fantasy is when it feels like magic has always looked this way and always shall. And I'm like, this is your science and your God. Like, surely there's people coming along with ingenuity and creativity, like Tess, the main, the new lead in Fragile Threads of Power is a 15 year old tinkerer who has the ability to manipulate the nature of reality around her. And yet I don't think it feels like it's breaking the rules of the world that I set up because it's she's still functioning within it. It's just, it always feels like there's something new to turn over. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, I think about it just in, in, in our world where, you know, where there is a magic, I mean, you, you, again, things, things evolve. We find ways to improve things. You know, we exactly. find ways to create things, to make things easier, to make things better, to make things more fun. And so like, yeah. it doesn't, it makes, <laughs> makes sense that magic would have the same you know, that would kind of follow that same path. And I mean, I'm such a nerd, but it's like, what does an antique look like then in Red London? You know, what does an uh-huh. antique, like what was a, f- and that's where you get something like the inheritor, which is like a device that originally allowed one magician to transfer their magic to their heir. But it was seen as like, everyone used it for the wrong reasons and everyone used it to steal other people's magic. And so it was done away, but it's a piece of failed magic. And I yeah. like the idea of having relics of having, pieces that they were like, you know what? Bad idea. Let's just scrap that one. <laughs> no, and, I, and even, in, and, and I'm, now I'm like thinking back and I was like, I remember, yeah, like Kel, when he's collecting, it's these yeah. like, cause he's so fascinated with like how you've adapted, like how we've adapted and how we've sort of evolved and to, to solve problems without, you know, without magic. He and loves then even, it. But, yes. He but loves even, Great London. Cause it's, you have like in our world, you have to do things with technology and he mm-hmm. and they don't and he comments on this in the very beginning of a darker shade of magic that one of his favorite things is the architecture in gray london because 
having earth movers and stone movers and all of these magicians in his world makes the architecture extremely fickle because things can go up and come down yeah. all the time. Yeah. Whereas in, in our London, everything is so solid. It does. And it makes you like, as much as I would love to be living in a world of magic, it doesn't make you appreciate that. Yeah. He the loves structure. the music boxes. He loves automata. Like he loves the idea mm-hmm. of you having to make magic in your own ways. I love that. I think that's so beautiful. And I, it doesn't make, and then when you think of things and then you're walking around and you see yeah. things and, and it, it does, it kind of makes you feel like this is all magic. It's just, we figured well, it out. And I think that gets to a kind of core premise of the, of the in every book in the series, which is really figuring out the difference between uh, insider and outsider. Because mm-hmm. dealing with these four worlds, you always have somebody for whom any one of those worlds is normal, is baseline, is the thing that they've known all their life and someone for whom they've never set foot in that world before. And so a lot of the conflict and a lot of the interest in the new characters is like, okay, you take a character like Lila Bard, who's born in our London in a place without magic and has never felt like she belongs fully, put her into a world with magic and watch her adapt. Mm -hmm. And she's going to notice completely different things and engage with the world in a completely different way than Kel, who's lived there all his life and takes certain things as just for granted. And so I love looking at what happens when you take the character out of their pond And so having these four worlds allows you to constantly have someone who is learning to adapt to a new space. Is that outsider? Yeah. I love that. So you have, and I'm looking at your copy in the back and I see all like the post-it notes and all the notes. (laughs) All the notes. I love that, uh, which reminds me that you've been doing a uh, darker or shades of magic read along, which I... I'm kind of obsessed with it. I'm just obsessed in general of the idea of like an adult story time. I I feel like people talk about, you know, the importance of like reading to children. And every time I hear something, I'm like, what about the importance of reading to adults? <laughs> like, really, I think we could all use, and I'm not just talking about audiobooks. Audiobooks are lovely, but there is something about like a cu- contact, like a human and watch and, you know, whether you're in a room with someone and they're reading to you or you're on YouTube and you're watching someone read to you. I just think it's so, it's just so fun. And to just kind of get, um, and the fact that you're not even just like, you're not just reading, you're like, ta- you no. no, like I do little excerpts. In fact, I almost, I do almost no actual reading instead no. of <laughs> short form memorization where essentially I went through reread every book and then essentially recited it back uh, in small summary form, chapter by chapter to the camera in 10 episodes. So my brain, like, and I have a very strong rule for myself against not reading my books once they're on shelves because they become static entities and I'm not. Mm -hmm. I read a book probably 50 times before it's published because of the editing and yeah, yeah, obsession. But because of that, I had never actually reread Shades of Magic since it first came out. And so doing this read along involved me sitting down with the original trilogy and like annotating and reading and like memorize. And I was terrified because I was like, what if I hate it? This is going to be so uncomfortable for me because also I will like (laughs) self edit something I wrote last week. I don't want to get stuck like that. But honestly, it was really a joy. And I hope that that, if nothing else, comes through in the read-alongs, it's like, I'm having a really fun time holding that space with the readers and chatting with the readers. And I try and give behind the scenes glimpses into like, oh, well, this was actually the very first scene that I ever wrote for the book, or this is my favorite chapter in this book. And oh, here's a scene I don't even remember writing. And how weird is that? Like, there's just, (laughs) I try to just be very, very honest about each section and how I would do things differently 10 years later in a certain segment. And so, yeah, it's really just kind of like equal parts gossip and fandom and behind the scenes moment. No, I love it. And I did, I guess in my head when I first was like, oh, I'm going to check, you know, I want to, I did think it was going to just be like chapter one, (laughs) 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 like sitting with the giant armchair fire in the background. Yeah. And then I'm like, why does she have so many like posts? I'm like looking at all like your books. I just like, just tapped. like every single chapter I like summarized on a single post-it note so that I could be able to, cause that's the other part is like, you're not just memorizing. You then have to be entertaining. How can I like, I basically, I just had to refilm one because several were lost in a great hard drive accident. No. And, um, and I, I, one of them was like 27 minutes long. I don't think I took a breath. I don't think I, I don't think I ever looked down at the book or took a breath the whole time. So they, they exist in their imperfection. They're not meant to be like perfectly curated videos. They're meant to be very informal, honest 
walkthroughs. And I also, it's because I'm the kind of reader who, like, I need a refresher. Like, I need someone to refresh my memory of what happens, especially because, yes, you can start with fragile threads of power. But I do believe there's a level of nuance that you might not get in terms of the old cast, in terms of how far they've come without Shades of Magic. So obviously, you want people to read Shades of Magic before Threads of Power if they have the time. But if they don't have the time, the read-along videos are really good. Oh, they're fantastic. And yeah. I do. And there are times when like, and I always challenge myself and I did I did the same thing this time and I literally have the stack and they just keep on getting bigger, Victoria. Yep. I just, <laughs> like they just keep oh, on. I don't know why they keep getting longer. <laughs> they just keep on. And I was like, because I and I've done this before, like where yeah. like a new book is coming out and say maybe there's been some time and I'm like, I'm going to go back and read every single. And then you start and you're like, oh my God. Like, I, you know <laughs> It is. And, so then, and then the extent when I started the videos and realized I was like, oh, you're just doing like synopsis and oh, then all this commentary. Cliff I, am, I was like, this is and commentary. And this is brilliant because then you can kind of follow. And then like the fact that you do, you know, you have the book there. You do remember lines. Obviously, we all remember certain lines because they just stay with us. But it was just I think the whole idea is brilliant. I had to say bravo. Oh, thank you. Um, thank I also you. had to say I'm very uh, I'm a big fan of the uh, furry guests that. Uh, oh, God. That They're their... the worst. Thomas mostly <laughs> because he has to be there at the worst of times. And Chauncey, because he's always just out of frame. Yeah. And <laughs> just like you see like the gray frame. poof, yeah. like in the side. It's, it, it's been an ordeal. It's, they, they just think it's all about them. It's fine. I know I should, I refuse to give them their own social media because then I know no one would follow me. It's okay. I've accepted it. <laughs> well, I, I did. I, did, I, I was, uh, I enjoyed your dogs, your, your dogs. Oh, yes. That was also, that was very enjoyable. So, but I, I do, you know, the other furry friends, you can't, you can't. Of course, can't. my favorite thing is someone posted, they were in their living room and they were casting the read along video to their television. And Thomas was sitting on the edge of my chair in the, on the screen and their cats came up and were like trying to make direct <laughs> eye contact with Thomas, <laughs> like just very, so there's just two cats having like a face off in the corner of my screen. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And so, I mean, I'm, I imagine, I've loved it. I imagine the fan response has been wonderful. And I mean, like being able to sort of connect with your fans, literally like having a sort of a love fest, a Shades of Magic love fest, essentially before before this it's new work comes out. very nice. The engagement's nice to have the interaction, but it's also just nice to have a very intimate form. So much of social media is flash and pan and is there and gone. Mm -hmm. And it's really nice to have a place where it feels like not only can the readers and the fandom interact with me, they can interact with each other mm -hmm. and they talk to each other. And, and I just think it's really cool community building. It, I don't know. I just think I've, I've had a really nice time doing it. No, it's wonderful. I mean, that's one of the things that, you know, for better or worse, I do kind of, I, I kind of love about, you know, book talk and the, you yeah. know, these sort of social communities as much as like, there will never be anything to me better than just walking into a random bookstore, like seeing someone like holding a book and, whether I know about that book or I don't know about that book and like striking up a conversation or looking at the rec cards, talking to the booksellers, you know, like having conversations with not only with the readers in the shops, but the booksellers that are there as well. Like that to me is just, that's like perfect afternoon, you know, like having, having conversations around books and we obviously can't always be with each other. And so these other forms, you know, whether it be like the book talk or these YouTube videos, um, these read alongs, it's just been, it's, being able to have conversations around stories and characters and how they make us feel, it's just really wonderful. And I just, I love it. I love it so much. So which brings me to, you know, we're we're reading along, huh. but we have new covers. We do. We have new editions. We have new editions um, and I have them all. And I love that you've been doing these like, sort of like... <laughs> Well, they kind of lend themselves to these reveals, these like little sets. Yes. Um, so, and I mean, the other covers, I will say. The other they're covers iconic. Are, they're so iconic. I remember like, you know, like hearing like, okay, we're going to do new covers. And like immediately, you know, you clam up like, what? Yes. <laughs> I know. I know. Like, okay. Like, what are we doing? But I think that's the problem with like also having years between. Mm -hmm. covers, which is not to say like my OG covers are stunning. They're exquisite. They were also at the time when they came out at the forefront yeah. of specific design. Like they, they were really among the like they were the first red, black, white, like graphic, iconic yep. covers. And in the seven, eight years between, like that has become kind of a design staple in fantasy. And I did truly think that like they might not stand out as well mm -hmm. as they had. And so part of the challenge of like I've always been extremely lucky with covers, but part of the challenge is like. 
how do you have covers that put you at the forefront of a conversation in 2023, not just continuing a conversation that was there in 2015. Also, as much as I love my original covers, there obviously was like somebody who didn't pick them up. And so it's about like, how do you then try and, and find new readers as well as continuing your love for your existing audience? One of the challenges of any publisher is to say like, how do we capture people this time that we didn't capture mm-hmm. last time? And to be honest, like the other option was not giving Shades of Magic new covers and the Threads of Power cover still would not have matched it because it's seven years later and it's, you know, they're going to want something new. So I fought really hard to make sure that the Shades of Magic books got an update as well, because the alternative was no matching covers ever, just <laughs> the series. And that's catastrophic in a different way. But I love them because they look like movie posters. I love them because they feel like pop culture, which they is do. like all I ever wanted to do is write accessible fantasy, write fantasy that makes you forget that you're reading, that just like drags you in. Uh, I'm the kind of reader who, when I was young, I felt very off put by a lot of fantasy because it felt mm-hmm. like I had to prove that I was smart enough or that I deserved to like be part of the fandom. And so with Shades of Magic in particular, my biggest goal was to convert people who said they don't like fantasy. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, I, I have that, I feel like I have that struggle every day. Um, we just talking about, you know, that's, that's, that's what I do. I talk about fantasy books. I talk about science fiction and trying to, I think that there is sort of like a barrier. Like people feel like it's that they, they can't access it. It's not, it's not accessible or like, oh, that's, I think they immediately go to like high fantasy and that's you know, the and thing, like, right? oh, I can't, I can't enter that. I, I can't be there. I think about this all the time with like The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, which is a fantasy novel. Mm-hmm. And yet so many people who read that were like, I, I don't love fantasy. And I'm like, but you loved Addie LaRue. And they were like, yeah, but that's not fantasy. I was like, that's a deal with the devil over 300 <laughs> years. Like, I hate to break it to you. But that's a fantasy novel. But there's still this preconceived notion of what fantasy is. Fantasy is dragons. Fantasy yep. is Tolkien. Fantasy is like lots of hyphens and apostrophes and names. But fantasy is like a D&D game in a book, yep. right? Yep. But there's, I so like so much of my like, welcome to my TED talk of it all is trying to convince people that they can just like love the story and that they don't yeah. have to get bogged down at the threshold of a category. They don't, it's not a huge commitment. Yeah. And I think that just like m- most other, you know, fiction or whatnot, there's, there are, there are sub And exactly. I think that that's something where I feel like I, I tend to talk about, you know, somebody, and I just had, was having this conversation about like cozy fantasy and somebody was yeah. talking about, you know, like the, for instance, like House in the Cerulean Sea, like that. And they're like, oh, I don't read fantasy, but I read that. And I'm like, but that's it's fantasy. fantasy. Though. <laughs> and it's like, okay. So again, like to what you were saying, fantasy isn't just names you can't pronounce, languages you can't speak, worlds you don't understand, and dragons, and, you know, and people with and old men with pointy hats. Like it's not, that's that there's a whole, there's a whole spectrum. And the more I will say, I like had these just staring at me, like these guys. Yeah. The they really start and they, and they do and they do start to grow on you and then you feel like you're cheating and I'm like but I do I know I know I feel I feel betrayal sometimes <laughs> <laughs> but I I did and I was just like I mean people like, well the other you know the covers are iconic and I'm like but these covers are beautiful like and they're I mean, colorful yeah. and they're just they also, they do they just kind of grab you and you want to know be a, big, be a big <laughs> nerd, okay, to be very nerdy about it for a moment is that like the original series, that color palette was generated by Kel. Mm-hmm. And Kel's concept of the four worlds was this red, black, white yeah. color palette. And that was how he perceived the world. The new series, Threads, is about how Tess perceives the world. And Tess is someone who is surrounded by a cacophony of color because... Yeah literally magic manifests visually around her to a like migraine inducing point. And so I wanted the new cover for Fragile Threads to have this vibrancy that no, it's not how Kel's cover would be, of course, but like, this isn't Kel's book. This is about broadening the world and broadening our cast and understanding as well that like, how one person perceives an environment is not how another person perceives it. Yeah, no, and I love it. And I love how like you, you get through all these colors and then there, and then you get to, I know it's, and it's like, it's like, boom. I can't wait to see it with it's like, it's finishes, it's bobbles. Like, it's, I know it's I always, I'm like, looking, I'm like, I have my, bold. yes, I'm like, this is, which I'll, which, and I uh, honestly, I'm, I'm a, a little bit of a, I love collecting like advanced reader copies. There's <laughs> something about like those paper, those like first editions and 
Yes. Um, you know, again, they're always like, oh, these are, you know, they're not, they're not completely, you know, uncorrected and they're uh-huh. just dance copies. And I'm like, I love it. I love it. And it's raw form, or, <laughs> you know, mostly raw form. You know, again, thinking about, you know, I, I'm sure there's so many fans that have come to you, like you're saying, come to you through Addy. You know, again, these people who I don't read fantasy, but I love Addy and having obviously those conversations and, you know, they're probably discovering shades of magic for the first time. So after two and a half years, you finally got to finally go on tour, like to go back, but you got to finally go on tour um, this past spring for Addy. So what was it like? I mean, and now you're going to have a new tour of this. this <laughs> what was it like um, sort of reconnecting with those fans, old and new? And again, like knowing that these are, that these are, you know, a lot of them may be new and like reintroducing them to all of your work. And then my sub question is, how many Addie LaRue tattoos did you see? <laughs> Do you have a definitive number? <laughs> I saw hundreds, which is insane. I went, my favorite is that I went to Mysterious Galaxy in San Diego and four members of the staff all had Addie tattoos. And I'm like, that to me, it's one of the coolest things. It's, it's, it's amazing. I'm really glad I fought for that cover. The original Addie LaRue cover was, it wasn't the right cover, obviously. Mm-hmm. But uh, I fought. I kept going back and being like, I just want, I want a black cover with seven gold stars. Like, this is what you have to give me. Like, yes. Uh, and I pushed and I pushed and I pushed and I pushed and they finally gave it to me. And so it feels very validating to see that constellation. Think of all those tattoos that wouldn't exist. <laughs> but it was, it was so interesting to go on a paperback tour. It's not something I conventionally do. A paperback comes out uh, for Addy. It was two and a half years, but normally a year to two years yeah. after the, the hardcover. And you go on tour for the hardcover. And when you go on tour for a hardcover, you're promoting a book that people haven't read yet. And when you go on tour for a paperback, you're celebrating a book that most people have read. There was so much love and so much space held. And so many people found Addy, you know, because it came out during the pandemic, they felt it found that book at a very difficult time. And it's a book about stubborn hope, you know, and joy and, and finding small happiness. And it, and it meant a lot to a lot of people. And that was palpable. Yeah. And of course, like, because my brain works the way it is, I was like, nobody's ever going to love my other books. But here's the beautiful thing is like, I've now watched over the last two years, readers, some readers find me through Addy and then find Shades and yeah. find Vicious and find Gallant. And like, I, it's incredible. And I know that it's this trickle down system where, of course, not every Addy reader is going to become every Shades reader. But and Shades has its own fandom, which is always very important to remember that like I'm one of those weird authors where when I speak to my social media audience, I know that I'm not speaking to like one audience. Mm-hmm. I have people who follow me because they love my YA novels and people who follow me because they love Shades and people who follow me because they love Addy and people who follow me because they love my pets. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and so we love a good cat a day. I know, I know. And so I try to be very mindful of that, but it has been really hope inducing to see people come to shades and to come to my books, my other books with a measure of trust Uh because they're like, Oh, well, I want to see what else you have. And then it's really exciting when they love those other things. And I know that I've like converted them. And that's my goal is truly like, I just want to get people to enjoy the story and worry about the category after it. Um, And I think that Addie was a good first step in that, but I think that shades has that power too, because thankfully because of Addy and because it's something I've done a couple times now. I love being that fantasy series for people who think they don't like fantasy. I like being that threshold. Yeah, it's, and I, and I, I love that. I do love that Addy is sort of bringing people in and wow. then, and then because I, I, Shades of Magic, it it is accessible. It is, you know, you know, we do you do touch on, you know, yes, okay, we're, we're there's a there's a you know four worlds and it's a magical system and you know sure. like the, yes, there's 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 lots there. Also, found family and queer romance and friendship and you know, yes, of course, there's like some political intrigue and things, but it's really like because of that love letter to Full Metal Alchemist and to Avatar, like. My magic system is elemental and it's Mm -hmm. very nature based and it's very organic so that hopefully no matter how complicated it becomes at any one point, it still has a foundation, which is very easy for one to understand and grasp organically. And I think that's the thing is I want to make sure that I don't lose readers ever with the rules. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that that's the easiest part, right? That everything is in this context. It's not something where you need to like really be stretching to, to, to wrap your mind around 
an element. It's still at its foundation, very organic. It is. I feel like it's, it is definitely a, it, it is a series that will love you back. I will yeah. say that. I mean, literally one of the most important parts of the entire series is the relationship between Kel and Raya's brothers and the fact that like their lives are but tethered to one another and mm-hmm. the kind of interpersonal drama that happens when you realize you have to hold someone else's pain. Yeah. Okay. And I think we, I think that that's very human. That's a human reality for us, you know, and I think that, that many of us go through. And so I think that that's something, you know, with a lot of these fantasies that it's like a reminder, like there's, there's humanity and big heartedness at its core. So you've written, I'm, I'm like, I can't even hold this giant it's stack funny. of, of <laughs> so you've written, and these are just, this is just one series, but you've written short stories, graphic novels, which I love. You've also served as a, so no, more novels. You've also served as a creator, a writer, executive producer. And so I really love, um, when I've heard you speak at events, I really love how open you are about your writing process and sort of like the the uncertainties that you have and just all the emotions that go into, you know, when you are starting a journey, when you're starting whatever it may be, whether it be a graphic novel or a script or a novel or a short story. So you definitely have experiences across the board. So what have been, now that you've, you've, you've written in many mediums, have there been any unexpected surprises writing in all these different mediums? I think what's more surprising to me or just my philosophy is the similarity, which is mm-hmm. to say that like, I don't really think about the audience age or the medium so much as just trying to tell a story. And I think the thing that's been most surprising to me is that I have kind of enforced and have been allowed to enforce due to my success, a kind of policy that it's not about creating a narrower category for my work. I don't really, like Gallant, uh, which was my most recent book before Threads, is a book for all ages. Mm -hmm. Because I got really frustrated, this idea that like, because I'm writing it, it's automatically YA if it has a teenage girl in it. And I'm like, well, first of all, Threads of Power has two teenage girls at the (laughs) the core of it and it's very adult. But like, I feel like a lot, a few authors are really given permission to just write books. And yet so many of us are like, oh, you write this kind of book or it's only for this age or I'm too old for this. And I'm like, but the thing I found in having such a broad audience across so many ages and demographics is like, we all can read the same story at different times in our life and take away different things. And so one of the things that I really love to do now is create fewer boundaries, Mm -hmm. create fewer declarations. Like, of course, I know from a bookstore perspective, we need a place to shelve them, right? But I would rather be shelved in more places. I'd rather have things that are cross-listed. I'd rather be able to, I just got so tired of like readers coming up to me being like, I know I'm not the demographic, but, and I'm like, It's like reading is like jigsaw puzzles, right? Like they tend to have a lower age guideline, but no upper age limit. You're never too old for a jigsaw puzzle. Like I want to create a space where people just think, oh, I just like her books. Not like, oh, well, I like her adult books, but I'd never read her YA or I like her YA, but I wouldn't read her middle. Like I'm just like, just read the stories, just have stories. And so because of that, as long as it's a written form, I don't, I try not to impose very many creative restrictions on myself before the industry does. I think I used to be very anticipatory of restriction and think, oh, I need to play within this lane and make sure I don't stretch, make sure I don't do anything that will confuse the marketing engine. And now I don't do that. The only exception is really the TV and film side is a lot more. It's not just that it's more complicated. It's that you go from being like a tiny god writing in your Mm -hmm. world to being part of a committee. And I don't really love that because like working in TV and film, they're the people who get to make decisions are not the people who are the most creative. They're the people who have the most money. It's amazingly difficult to maintain a cohesive vision when there are 300 voices in the room Yeah, uh, as compared to one or two or three when you have your agent and your editorial team. And so I would say that as intoxicating as TV and film is, and as much as I love translating from one medium to another, I would say that I'll never give up novels because to me, this is where I feel my freest to actually be my most creative and most cohesive self. Mm-hmm. So I love it, but I think it will always need to be the icing and not the cake because it's very, very easy to get lost in the fact that uh, it's not yours. It's very yeah. easy to forget that it's not yours. Thinking of First Kill, and I have to ask because of, of all the fantasy uh, subgenres, I think vampire lore might be my favorite. I read Carmilla uh-huh. at a very young age and it was like, 
that's oh it, God. vampire. I'm <laughs> like, I think we're going to like my like, next novel. Then. <laughs> <laughs> like, I remember just being like, this exists. This has yeah. existed. You know, obviously at the time, <laughs> you know, at that point. Um, and be kind of like having my mind blown. This is like my freshman year of college. Are there any va- possible, even a sh- even another short story? I'll take it. Like, are there any? <laughs> and in terms of exploring that, I mean, you've done in terms of like you know the, the uh-huh. magic and the ho- and the magical house and the the different city. Like, you've explored so many um, subsets in fantasy. Is there room for vampires? Um, my next uh, adult standalone <laughs> novel, which is what I'm hoping will be like the spiritual successor to Addie LaRue. So mm-hmm. my next one of those is about three female vampires. Yeah, it's about three lesbian vampires. And uh, it is like, it's very much the aesthetic I would give you is the the n- kind of latest version of Florence and the Machine. Uh, that kind of aesthetic that she's been crushing yes. for the last year and a half. It is set over 500 years and it is an intertwined tale of toxic romance between three lesbians. I'm like, chills. Just like <laughs> everything you're saying. I'm like, mm-hmm. So it is also the darkest thing I've ever written and uh, the most, I can't say it. I was about to say something. <laughs> I was like, oh, then I'll have to ask you to cut it. Um, <laughs> definitely like the, probably the most sexual of anything I've ever written as well. Well, I mean, I think vampire, I think you, I think you're... it's in, I think it's, you know what it is? Uh, so Addie was a book about hope and joy and optimism. This is a book about <laughs> hunger and rage. Yes. And it is just those two things. And it's but about it's a... being insatiable and about having hunger and being in a femme presenting form and the ways in which you're told to be satiated when you don't feel it. I love that. I mean, I think that's, that's very, it's very, a little bit yin and yang there. So they, if you said. Exactly. Choose your meal. (laughs) Would you rather have this like, you know, like raspberry sorbet and dark chocolate, which is my (laughs) vampire. So would you rather have like a lemon sorbet and a little wafer, which is Addy, but they're both (laughs) a little bitter and a little sweet. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So now I almost would be like, okay, I'm done. Um, <laughs> that's all I wanted. That's amazing. I think I, I just, in recent times, there's been a lot of um, vampire books. We're not going to sure. get into them. And I feel like there's been different lures. Everyone sure. kind of takes their own. It's time for me to have my own. I like, yes. I have a very strong philosophy on whenever I write a supernatural element, whether it's magic or super villains or vampires or which is I like, I want to figure out my own rules. And this mm-hmm. is definitely me setting out my own rules. And I would say it's like the very femme counterpart to the new TV version of Interview with a Vampire in that it's like canonically queer. It is like aggressive. It's It does not romanticize toxic relationship, but it is very much at the forefront. It's well, an exploration of toxicity and, and I, <laughs> I am very excited. Fuck <laughs> yeah. All I wanted to know. Probably I was like, not say anything else or I will get. I <laughs> so my next question was, again, it was going to be, I was like, not to be greedy. Because obviously oh, you've that? just given us this amazing new novel <laughs> and and a series to look forward yeah. to. But yeah, what's next for you? That so is, is it, next. it's, this is what's yeah. next. So is, yeah, it, is this something uh, that's going to come in uh, before the next or? Yes. So my goal essentially is to alternate between uh, the threads of power series and this and victorious which is the third villains book so my goal is for threads of power one and then this book that i almost revealed the title of and that <laughs> hasn't been announced yet and then threads of power two and then victorious and then threads of power three well that's, that's uh, the goal <laughs> that's, that's a but lot I'm um, one small human and I, I it's hard. I feel like I should be like waving you through that. I'm like, it's, it's going to be hard. okay. I'm a little <laughs> daunted right now. But so on top of the fact that you have this, I'm going to say a pretty insane writing schedule, like all these things, you are also an extremely avid reader. I love when you post your like, <laughs> these are all the books I've like just casually read last year. And it's like a hundred books. It was 175. Uh, but 175. I want to say that I'm... <laughs> Very behind this year due to oh, that. Yeah, definitely, definitely slacking Only at like here. Sixty so far oh this. Year. So, but I love that because it's just you know I think that you are a, just a product of just you know reading these stories and your own you know what they bring to you and then kind of filtering through you and writing these beautiful prose, writing these wonderful worlds. But so I'm going to ask you because I love to I love to close out my interviews with this because I love b- book recommendations from brilliant women. So what are you, what are you reading now? Or I would like to give you the option because some people are like, I'm not reading anything right now. Or 
what was the last thing you read that you just you like can't stop talking about? I can answer both of those because I so I I'm in a stage of drafting where I um, have to be very careful about fiction because I've just am in a precarious place and sometimes I don't want to get like other people's voices and mm-hmm. plot structures in my head when I'm trying to hold up a world as complicated as the one for Bones, which is the nickname for the vampire, it's not the real title for it. So I've been listening to a lot of uh, audio nonfiction because it's something that I can carry with me. And so I just listened to Malcolm Gladwell's The Bomber Mafia, which was really, yeah. really good. And I also just listened to Maggie Smith's, or You Could Make This Place Beautiful. It is exquisite. Fictionally, the last book I read that made me like evangelical was Painted Devils, which is the sequel uh, to Little Thieves by Margaret Owen. And I am so enamored. Talk about a fantasy series that it, even if you think that fantasy isn't your bag, you should pick up this fantasy series. It is exquisite. It is about a girl, a con girl. And uh, she has two godparents. One is fortune and one is death. And it is just so good. It is delicious. I love that. I love, see, this is what I'm, this is what I'm talking about. Like book recommendations, talking about books, screaming them from the rooftops. That's amazing. I love it. Victoria, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for these, for these books. Again, I can't even lift them up again. It's only 600,000 words between the four. only. (laughs) Only. And I love looking at the spines and just seeing them get like bigger and bigger and bigger. I do think it's cheating because they definitely reduce the margins between three and four for paper costs. And so (laughs) it looks like like Conjuring of Light and Fragile Threads of Power are almost the same length. And they're not. I mean, Conjuring of Light is 165,000 words and... Fragile Threads of Power is 195,000 words. So they, there's some magic that has been warp wrought in the typesetting. But that's, make it that's okay. We, we want magic in our story. We want exactly. magic in our paper. Magic um, in the page count. Yeah, magic, magic in the page, page count. count. It's, it's everything. Um, and this book is everything. Thank you. Thank you again. Fragile Threads of Power is out now. Thank you so much. Hey readers, it's time for another TBR Top Off. We're going to recommend a couple of great books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of Fragile Threads of Power. I'm Mark. I'm coming to you from my Barnes & Noble in Cincinnati, and I'm joined by my book buddy, Madison. Hey, Madison. Hi, I'm Madison. I'm coming to you from my Barnes & Noble in Los Angeles. So I'm going to go ahead and kick things off. I was thinking about great magic systems, interesting world builds, and a book just keeps bubbling up to the surface, and that is The Jasmine Throne by Tasha Suri. This is a very rich world uh, that is being created. It's the first book of a trilogy, and you have world building. You have beautiful writing. You have characters that you really want to root for and who really shine on the page. It follows essentially two women who are entrenched in palace intrigue and ancient magics, and they find liberation and strength in themselves and in each other. So Malini is a princess who has been essentially exiled to stay in this ruin uh, for her act of treachery. Then we have Priya, who is a servant who has been tasked for uh, taking care of um, the princess. She also harbors a very dangerous and powerful secret. And once this secret is revealed to Malini, the two of them start this journey that will ultimately lead them to potentially throwing over an entire empire, while also unlocking the feelings that they have for each other. So there's a bit of a sapphic element to this as well. Um, and the way that these characters build into something lovely is is very, very satisfying. The two characters are very refreshing, and the side characters for that matter. And all of them are very morally unpredictable. I, morally gray is a term that gets thrown around quite a bit, um, and it's done in varying degrees of success in novels. But these two feel very lived in, in a way that the choices that they make are informed by their own uh, experiences, and it hits morally gray in in just the right way. But also, the setting of this book is intricately detailed. It's very, very beautiful. The writing builds on this fully realized world that readers will be sure to enjoy. So if you are looking for something new in the fantasy realm or just a really fantastic escape, look no further than The Jasmine Throne by Tasha Suri. 
Madison, what do you have for us? Good pick. Uh, when I was thinking, I also was thinking about like in, kind of like the intricate magic systems, which I think is something V. Schwab does really, really well when writing. And so when I was thinking, I was thinking of kind of like an adult Harry Potter book is kind of how we dub it here at our store, which is Magic for Liars by Sarah Gailey. This book is kind of it is fantasy. If you're a mystery thriller fan, I would pick it up, especially if you want a hint of something different. Uh, because it does have that aspect to it. But why I chose this book was because it is centered around a character, Ivy Gamble, and she has no magic at all. In this world, you either have magic or you don't. And that kind of like sets up the basis of your how your life is going to go. Uh, so Ivy Gamble was the sister that was born without magic. She has no desire to be magical supposedly, but she is a fantastic private investigator. So while her life kind of feels like in shambles and she might come off a bit as like a kind of depressing character that like there's like this innate tiny hunger for magic, she's she's doing what she can without it. But what happens is there is a murder at her estranged twin sister's school where she is a professor it's this magic academy and there's a murder and the only person on the case is in this writing I think what Gailey does really well is you can see there is those like classic fantasy tropes but it's done in such a well way that not necessarily poking fun is the wrong word but kind of makes light of those fantasy tropes and like slightly kind of debunks them is what I would say So, like, even though Ivy exists in a world that is, like, magical, and if you have magic, like, you're kind of above everyone else in the, like, society layout, you don't necessarily need it to be, like, this amazing, strong character, which I think she proves and I think is written so well throughout the book, which is why I chose Magic for Liars by Sarah Gailey. And it's full of twists and turns, so we always love that. So we you got a little fancy, a little thrill. Yeah, we always love that. And I think Sarah Gailey does a good job, too, like you were saying, that not necessarily like pokes fun, but it's written with an eye roll in a way that is not yucking on somebody's yum, as um, folks are saying these days. So it's playful in a way that is very charming. And if you are entrenched in those kinds of novels, you'll be in on the joke. But if not, you're still going to have a great time. So nice mm-hmm. pick. But that is all we have for today. Thanks so much for tuning in to Pour It Over. Uh, Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. Pretty simple. I'm Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. And I'm Madison. You can follow my home store at BN Events Grove. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Happy reading. Bye. Happy reading. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. Pour It Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.